All right, so um, we're in the middle of talking about blood flow, and we know that blood pressure is one of the things that induces blood flow, and then we also have resistance of the tube that basically pushes back on blood flow. And so we're going to have this proportion of change in pressure over resistance that dictates blood flow. And so I'm basically handling each of those variables separately, dealing with blood pressure first, and then we'll work through um, resistance here in a, in a short while. So this is a trace of uh, blood pressure. We know that we can dr directly measure it, which is invasive, using um, pulse pressure probes that get inserted directly into a portion of the circulatory system or even directly within one of the chambers of the heart. Or we can measure it indirectly and use inference um, to say, okay, if the pressure at the brachial artery or some other location is this, then we expect the pressure in the uh, left ventricle to, to be this, these values here. Whenever we measure blood pressure, and that's what you're looking at here in this figure, we have two different pressures that are experienced in the system. We have the pressure in the system when the heart is relaxed, or when I really should say when the ventricle is not contracting, and then we have the pressure induced in the system when the ventricle is contracting. So whenever you measure blood pressure, you really measure those two bookends, highest pressure and lowest pressure. So we have two pressures that are going to be measured. And those two pressures are going to be the systolic and the diastolic. The systolic pressure is going to be your peak pressure during ventricular contraction. Okay, so peak pressure during ventricular contraction. And again, when the left ventricle contracts, that's a very large muscular chamber. And so this really induces a high amount of pressure. And so your systolic is going to be the highest pressure that we have in the system. I'm going to have to take a brief moment here to reorient the screen. Bear with me. Yes. Every time it dings, it means I'm winning. This should be a lot better. Now, most of the time we're talking about left ventricular systole and diastole, and that's really what we're most concerned about. But we actually can measure the systole and diastole in any of the chambers or any part of the circulatory system. We are going to have the greatest systolic pressure experienced in the ventricle. And really, the left ventricle, the chamber of the left ventricle, is going to have the highest amounts of pressure. The right ventricle is going to have some pretty high pressures as well. Not quite as high as the left ventricle. What do you think the lowest systolic pressure is going to be experienced? It'll be in the vena cava. It'll basically be the complete opposite end of the circulatory circuit from the ventricle. And what we see as we go from the chamber of the ventricle to the vena cava, everything in between, the pressure is slowly decreasing. So we have this drop in pressure, systolic pressure, as we move away from the ventricle. So this figure here, it's basically showing in blue here the general circuit or systemic circuit pressure from the left ventricle as we enter into the aorta, go through the arterioles, 
capillaries, venules, down to the veins, and over here would be the inferior and superior vena cava. So it remains relatively high through the major arteries and then begins to drop as we move through the rest of the circulation. Pulmonary circuit, much lower here, still relatively high from the right ventricle through the uh, pulmonary circulation and then coming back in to the heart from the pulmonary, the pulmonary veins. Now this original figure here is just showing basically average pressure. If we look at it in a little more detail and look at the systolic and diastolic, pressure jumps between the two as the heart contracts. And so in all reality, what you would see is your systolic pressure, diastolic, systolic, diastolic, over and over again. And, and that repeats, but the, the change between the systolic and the diastolic slowly reduces until as we leave the capillaries is basically no longer existent. In fact, you no longer really see a pulse in those uh, portions of circulation. And you have perhaps experienced this before. Has anyone ever cut an artery? It doesn't happen frequently, but when it does, you know you cut an artery because blood spurts out. Every time your heart beats, you actually see blood squirt out. Whereas most of the cuts are going to either be within the capillary or within the veins, and it just sort of oozes. And you don't really have that pulsatile pumping as the heart goes through its contraction. And that's due to the changes in pressure that we experience as we move further and further away from the ventricle. <laughs> All right, so that's our systolic pressure. What about our diastolic pressure? Diastolic pressure is going to be a minimal pressure. And this is going to be the pressure in the system during ventricular relaxation. So when the ventricle is not contracting when it is in its relaxed state. Uh, here too, uh, just to give you an idea of the greatest diastolic pressure, this is also going to be in the ventricle. And the lowest diastolic pressure, which you probably can gather from this figure here, is going to be in the vena cava. And in fact, this lowest pressure systolic and diastolic are actually going to be equal. So there really is no change from like what we have here in the brachial artery from 70 to 110 down to 70 every time the heart beats, really there is no perceptible differences in pressures in, in, in the, the vena cava during systole and diastole. Equal pressures, and they're very minimal. In fact, that's very close to zero pressure. All right, so that's blood pressure in a nutshell. Um, but there's actually some additional information and variables that can be obtained and estimated and calculated uh, based off the pressure. One of them is the pulse pressure. So you can go and you can measure your blood pressure. Use a pressure cuff and a sphygma manometer and a stethoscope. And if you're a normal human, it's going to be right around 110 over 70. Um, as we go up from there, we go into prehypertension and then hypertensive stage one, stage two. Um, so this is our systolic. This is our diastolic. Pulse pressure is actually going to be calculated as the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressures. 
So the difference between systolic and diastolic, you would just simply take the 110 minus the 70, and you have a pulse pressure of 40. So a normal pulse pressure would be right around 40. As the diastolic and systolic change, and really the systolic pressure is usually what changes the most, people who have hypertension typically are going to be systolic range of 135 and above, and diastolic really not that much different. In some cases, it will go up or down, but most of the time, it's just simply a upward trend in the systolic pressure. So you can calculate a pulse pressure, and as pulse pressure increases from 40 to 50 to 60, we're actually able to quantify or provide a measure of the stress on our smaller arteries. So as pulse pressure increases, there is an increased amount of stress induced on small arteries. Now if you think back on the anatomy of the small arteries, these are going to have less muscle tissue. The aorta has a ton of muscle, and it makes it very elastic, and so it can withstand those great changes in pressure. Smaller arteries have far less muscle compared to the aorta, so they can't stand withstand these giant changes in pressure. So the pulse pressure, as it increases, there is more stress on the arteries, the smaller arteries. Increases likelihood for aneurysm, which is blood seeping out between the uh, cells that make up the luminal wall of the vessel and can lead towards some very problematic conditions um, that actually can be extremely life-threatening. So pulse pressure is going to be an indicator of small artery stress. We can also calculate a mean arterial pressure. This is most frequently in clinical and research settings referred to uh, simply as MAP, M-A-P, the mean arterial pressure. And the mean arterial pressure is a calculation of the average pressure in arteries. Now, even though we're using the term average, we're actually not referring to an arithmetic mean. So what do I mean by an arithmetic mean? I basically mean that we take our systolic and our diastolic, add them together, divide by two. Right? That would get us, give us the arithmetic mean. So the mean arterial pressure is not equal to simply taking our diastolic plus our systolic <coughs> all over two. And the reason that is, is because diastole is actually longer in duration. So the heart spends a longer amount of time in a you know, low the lower pressure of diastole. And so if we want a true average for mean arterial pressure, we're going to estimate this just a little bit differently, not using an arithmetic mean. What we'll do is we'll take our measured diastolic pressure, so we're going to estimate this using the diastolic pressure, and we're going to add that to one-third of the pulse pressure. And I'm going to actually write this out so you can see this in a little bit better detail, uh, what our mean arterial pressure would be for an example. But basically, using the pulse pressure and a third of that pulse pressure, we're accounting for the, um, the difference in time spent in systole and diastole between, uh, within the heart. Okay, so let's actually put some numbers here. So let's say you go into a clinic and you take an uh, individual's blood pressure. And that blood pressure is pretty good, 105 over 65. By the way, what are the units that I'd be using here? 
Most of the time, you just get, oh, your blood pressure is 110 over 70. But it's actually a pressure measurement, so there's actually a unit. What's that? OK, and MMHG stands for? It stands for millimeters of mercury. Now, we don't really use mercury columns anymore, but when we first started using blood pressure, Mercury responds to changes in pressure really, really well. And the way that we could quantify pressure is we could take a tube that we could fill up with mercury. And that tube would be calibrated so we'd know the exact distances. And as more and more pressure is pushed on that mercury, it would cause the mercury to move up at a known, at a known rate. Now we actually use air valves now. Um, I'm blanking on the name, the, the technical name. But we're still using basically calibrated to the millimeters of mercury for pressure since that's been the standard. Um, so yeah, the gauges that you use, they're not usually mercury based. They're basically picking up changes. Gosh, what is the name of those pressure gauges? Well, anyways, they're picking up the, the, the pressure based off of displacement, air displacement, rather than moving a column of mercury has anyone ever seen? Uh, I've seen a few of them at some older doctor's offices that haven't renovated for a very long time. They still have a column of mercury. Uh, on the wall. What's that? Is it on the wall? No, usually they're on a stand, like an IV stand, because the column is, they're, they're usually about this long. And you sit there and you pump it up and you see the increase in the, the uh, column of mercury as it moves up. It's actually a lot easier to teach students on a mercury uh, signal mammometer, mammometer because you can actually see the mercury hop as the heart starts to beat. So the first place it hops correlates to that first sound, which is they're called their crop cough sounds. And then as it goes away, you'll hear the third, the fourth, and then it'll disappear. All right, anyway, so yeah, millimeters of mercury, 105 over 65, really a decent blood pressure. So how are we going to calculate our mean arterial pressure? First, we also have to calculate our pulse pressure, right? And anyone remember what pulse pressure was? The difference between OK, difference between systolic and diastolic. So mean arterial pressure, that's supposed to be a question mark, not a three with a dot below it. <laughs> How am I going to set this up? Okay, so what's our what's the first part of the equation? It was our okay diastolic pressure, and what is our diastolic pressure in this example? Sixty-five. Diastolic is always on the bottom. It's always or typically the lower number, not necessarily most of the time though. Unless something very, very strange is going on. And then we add that to one third of my pulse pressure. And how do I calculate pulse pressure? Okay, and that's going to be. Uh, how about you just tell me how, what the, the math is? Don't skip steps. 105 minus 65. Okay, and I got my one third in there. Let me give you a tip that I would hope you would hear in your math class. Don't do any of the steps in your head because you're gonna you're gonna mess up. So write each step down. Everybody was trying to calculate the the pulse pressure um, in their head. Just write it down so you have everything that you need. And use a calculator. Yeah, so for the next exam, maybe it'd be wise to have a calculator. So if you go through and do the calculation, anyone do it? I'm just going to give it to you. Don't worry about it. It's going to be 78. Okay, so this is our mean arterial pressure uh, units. What are my units going to be? Still going to be millimeters of mercury. If we mathematically were to put those in, 
along each of our you're going to find out that we don't eliminate it. We're actually going to preserve it. So 78 millimeters of mercury for this individual. So what is the mean arterial pressure actually going to tell us? So yeah, so we're looking at average pressure in the arteries, and as we change systolic pressure or diastolic pressure, mean arterial pressure is also going to change as well. And what it ends up being is that the mean arterial pressure in the aorta or any of our vessels within the uh, circulatory system is going to be a factor that influences our rate of flow. So. When I go back and I say change in pressure between two different locations and uh, resistance equals or is proportional to flow, we're actually referencing our mean arterial pressure. Okay? Instead of using the raw blood pressure or systolic pressure or diastolic or using both of them, we quantify it down to our mean arterial pressure. And it's actually the changes in mean arterial pressure from one location to another location that are going to be proportional to blood flow. Does that make sense? So going back to that original equation, blood flow you know, is proportional. Blood flow is proportional to our change in pressure over our resistance. Pop in mean arterial pressure, the difference in mean arterial pressure between two different locations. So that means to do any sort of blood flow analysis, we would have to measure pressures invasively directly at those two locations, maybe the left ventricle and then maybe the brachial artery. So we insert a pressure transducer into the left ventricle and get the pressures there and calculate a mean arterial pressure or at the aorta. And then we can take a look at the mean arterial pressure at the brachial artery, calculate the difference, and that would give us a change in pressure here. And then we'd have to just go through and quantify resistance in some form or fashion, and we could actually give some reasonable estimates and predictions of blood flow. All right, so let's talk about the second factor here, resistance. Pressure is obviously related to function of the heart, the uh, ventricular contraction of the heart and changing pressure from systolic to diastolic. Resistance is actually going to be quite a bit more complicated. Most commonly, we're going to use a form of resistance known as peripheral resistance. And this is going to be the resistance that has opposition <coughs> to blood flow moving away from the heart. Okay? And peripheral resistance. Uh, we're actually going to have to deal with a variety of variables. So it's not just simply measuring resistance the same way we're measuring pressure. There are a variety of things that we need to know about, a variety of characteristics of the vessel. And we're going to talk about those, and we can actually model those mathematically. Uh, so the picture that you're looking at here we have two different vessels. We have two different chambers. Let's start with the chambers, okay? And there are differences in pressure between the chambers, okay? So this is our pressure difference. And then we need to know about resistance here. What is our flow going to equate to? Well, the flow is going to equate to the differences in resistance. And notice that one of the characteristics of resistance is obviously going to be related to the size of the chamber. So as 
tube size decreases, diameter of the tube decreases here, results in a decrease in flow. Resistance here is low because of the much larger tube size, larger diameter, and it's a higher rate of flow. Okay? So higher pressure on this side, lower pressure on this side, indicating that we have movement in this direction because of the pressure. But then we also have the characteristics of resistance, basically pushing back on this chamber of fluid here are the resistances from these two tubes based off of their size. So we can model peripheral resistance as peripheral resistance equals A times B times L all over pi R to the fourth. What? <laughs> so it's 8 times V times L all over pi R to the fourth. Now each of these is actually going to be a quantifiable variable. Each of those variables I'm going to give you a, a description of what the variable is. The things are going to get a little bit easier here in just a second. And you'll see why. So V equals the viscosity of the fluid. Yeah. Okay, so viscosity of the fluid. What is viscosity? Does anyone happen to know? Okay, it's how thick the solution is. You are probably most familiar with viscosity in terms of motor oil. You go to the auto parts store and your car probably takes something like 10W30 or something like that, or 5W30. <coughs> and what that is telling you is the viscosity when the engine is cold and the viscosity when the engine is warm. So viscosity uh, of the old motor oil actually reduces. It becomes thinner as the motor warms up. And so you go from a viscosity of 30 down to 10 or down to 5. In terms of blood, your viscosity is going to be related to how, much red, how many red blood cells are present, how much fluid is present, and it probably should not change all that frequently. It changes if you do some uh, illegal things like blood doping. You can change it in a heartbeat, which is where you would take out uh, about a pint of blood, centrifuge it down just to get the red cell mass, then allow your body six weeks to regenerate, and then you put those red cells back in, and it artificially increase, increases your red blood cell count and increases hemoglobin and can increase the viscosity of the blood. It's, it's ergogenic. It's performance enhancing. He did not. I don't think he ever did any blood doping. He did a lot, a lot of other things that were, that were a, lot, a lot worse. Yes, the blood mobile was here yesterday because um, I have my Tour de France tryout in about six weeks. <laughs> No, um, yeah, but increasing the viscosity of your blood, I guess to kind of chase a rabbit trail here and talk about Lance Armstrong, does anyone know the name Marco Pantani? Uh, he's Italian, or he was. He, 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 was, he was Italian, he wrote for... Uh, he died. <laughs> it was a combination of... Uh, blood doping and cocaine use, which oh, both cause yeah. changes in the left ventricular, uh, the left ventricular mass. So, with increases in viscosity, if I draw the heart here, that's a beautiful heart. So, in the inner chamber, the the chamber of uh, left ventricle, it's got thickened mass here. On the outside. You don't have anything that the heart can grow into. I mean, it's stuck inside of a cavity, and it's held in there. So if we increase viscosity, the heart has to work harder, right? There's more pumping action that is required to move that thicker solution. And the heart can't grow out this way, so it actually begins to grow in this way. And you can already see the problem. As you begin to lose this tissue, you begin to reduce the size of the chamber. That's called left ventricular hy uh, uh, myocardial hypertrophy. 
And as you reduce the size of the chamber, you're reducing things like stroke volume. Stroke volume is really critical to maintain cardiac output and perfusion of things like the brain and the heart itself. Individuals who are habitually involved in blood doping, they have been other things too. Um, power lifters, people, you know, the really big bulky guys who are under a tremendous amount of strain as they're lifting, they increase left ventricular pressures as well, and their heart responds by reducing, increasing muscle mass, but reducing chamber size. This results in a lack of ability to perfuse. And if you do something that requires high blood flow, like cocaine, <laughs> it results in your body's inability to perfuse the tissue in the brain, and people lose their lives that way. So yeah, there's been actually a surprising number of long endurance athletes who have used this sort of technique and have caused severe problems. The so fun it, it increases your oxygen carrying capacity. And when you do it for the first time, it improves your performance without question. But you do it habitually for five or six or ten years and it catches up with you. Yeah, I mean I'm not gonna advocate that <laughs> this is the one this is the only time I'm gonna do this. <laughs> But um, why would you only do it for one game? I mean, well, we won the tour this year, but next year I'm not even going to qualify because. <laughs> so the ironic thing is, is even though Lance Armstrong, and, and don't get me wrong, I despise Lance Armstrong because he's a cheater. But who do you who do you give who do you give his tour victories to? I mean, the next guy was blood doping. The next guy was a cheater. The next guy was a cheater. I mean, the, the very last guy in the race was cheating as well. So, uh, what's that? They, are, they all cheat. It is. What are you doing? Can you reverse that? Like, is there any way to reverse that, or once it's done? No, really, once it's done, it, it, it's pretty permanent. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we have a new, I guess let me uh, digress here just a little bit. Um, we have a new student recreation facility that's going in. One of the things that's going to be there is some racquetball courts. There's also going to be a pool, there's going to be a weight room, and gyms. <laughs> of all of those things, where do you think the most deaths happen? Racquetball. They happen in a racquetball court. That's my favorite thing. Does anyone know why? <laughs> you know why? It's not, it's not from getting hit in the head. It's because you're holding on to that racket and you get these old guys in there who really don't have a great heart to begin with and they're squeezing on that racket as they're trying to beat their law partner or whoever, they, whoever they're trying to beat. And they increase pressure so much that their peripheral resistance begins to elevate enough where blood begins to not perfuse as, uh, eject from the heart as efficiently and we lose perfusion and they end up having a heart attack. Uh, yep. Squeezing a, racket. squeezing a racket or running in the airport and you hold on to your suitcase and you're like trying to make your flight, you already are exercising more and now you're squeezing your handle of your suitcase because you're so nervous and you're another one of those old guys and your heart's not really working all that well anyways. And well, professional tennis players, one, they're a lot younger than most of the guys who come and play racquetball. I mean, these guys are like 70 years old. Old people love they, they love their racquetball, without question. Uh, tennis players also, they're not as, they know how to compensate for their, for their play without squeezing the heck out of their racket. <laughs> Any other questions on how to die on campus? <laughs> Don't squeeze too hard, old man. <laughs> uh, all right, does everybody have our equation written down? Keep that keep that in mind. So V is the viscosity of the fluid. Really doesn't change that much under normal physiological circumstances. You would have to get really, really dehydrated, which most of the time we don't do that. Or we would have to do something else like blood doping to change viscosity significantly. L stands for the length of the tube. Now, how much do you think 
two length changes from, let's say, the aorta to the brachial artery. <laughs> the distance from here to here. How, how much has it changed on me in the last two seconds? Yeah. Zero. So length of the tube is basically a constant. You're going to pick two points that you're going to measure the peripheral resistance across. And so length of tube really is not changing all that much. Now, if we were to do this a little more dynamically and saying, okay, how is peripheral resistance changing as we move it along the way? Then, yeah, it's going to, I mean, each point that we choose, it's going to be a slightly longer tube length. But <clears throat> if we want to know peripheral resistance between this point and this point, between the aorta and the brachial artery, that's going to basically be a constant. So viscosity is a constant. Length of the tube is a constant. R. R is the radius of the tube. Pi, uh, obviously, not yummy, but 3.14159265. Check. So pi is simply 3.14. Radius of the tube is going to be R. How much does the radius of a vessel change? It actually changes a surprising amount. It changes lots. Now, what else do we have going on here with the radius that is important to keep in mind? Look back at the equation. The eight is a constant. It's just the eight. So radius, we already know that it changes a lot, but look at this. Radius is going to affect the flow the most, and it's actually not because radius changes so much. I mean, we may be talking about a Half a, half a centimeter increase in diameter of a large vessel. But the reason radius is affecting the flow the most is because of this. Because of the, that's supposed to be a four. Let's try that again. <laughs> because of this sign here. <laughs> because of the fourth power. So any change that happens in radius, you're going to take it to the fourth power. So that half centimeter change on its own isn't a whole lot, but the effects on peripheral resistance are taken to the fourth power. So <coughs> we did that half centimeter times a half centimeter times a half centimeter times a half centimeter. What causes changes in radius of a vessel? Uh, it could so that's called vaso motion, and you have basal constriction and you have basal dilation. Exercise will do it. Stress will do it. So just more blood flow. Sleeping can do it. Yeah, I mean, places where you need more blood flow or less blood flow is going to cause changes in, in, in radius of the tube. So you start to exercise. I really don't want a whole lot of blood flow into my kidneys because I don't want to make a whole bunch of urine while I'm in the middle of my exercise. So that happens, undergoes vasoconstriction. But now I'm using the muscle, skeletal muscle in my legs. And so those will go through, those will in, uh, go through vasodilation and more blood flow will permeate and perfuse the muscle there. Okay, so to kind of give a little bit of a summary here, radius effects flow the most primarily because it's the fourth power. Viscosity and tube length don't readily change. Viscosity can change, and it changes with your hydration status, but it's not like vasomotion. You can go from being vasoconstricted to vasodilated in a heartbeat. Whereas viscosity, you're talking maybe over an 8 or 10 hour period. If you don't drink water for that 8 or 10 hour period, you're going to begin to see increases in viscosity as the fluid thickens. But again, most of the time you drink in response to the, um, the first... Uh, sensation and, and you cover that and viscosity basically stays just about constant. So they, uh, the, the length doesn't change, the viscosity doesn't change, radius 
changes. And again, this is vasomotion. I'm going to have to, what time is it? 10.49. Uh, everybody have this? Via vasomotion. So vasomotion is the idea that the, the vessels change their size. Two types of vasomotion, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vasoconstriction, obviously, as its name sounds, that's a reduction in the radial size, radius size, and vasodilation is an increase. No, I said, is there, are you okay? Yeah, I was watching that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I didn't put another alien symbol up on the board. <laughs> So this leads to us to have the ability to adjust the tube radius. All right, so when we get back on Monday, we'll talk about blood flow in the vessel and we'll get a summary of blood flow. And then we still have to talk just a little bit about capillary exchange.